But we all know what happens when we're in God's Word on the iPhone. We're in God's Word right up until somebody texts us. And as much as we can say, well, I'm not going to be distracted. Uh, when that text comes through, you go, well, I'll just look real quickly and see what they need. And then whatever they need takes you on a 20-minute journey. And all of a sudden, you're doing the Wordle for the day. And you go, oh, man, I thought I was actually reading the Bible. So because God has revealed Himself to us through the Bible, we have the opportunity and responsibility to engage God's Word. And it is both of those. It's an opportunity and a responsibility. Uh, if you look at it as a responsibility without the opportunity, then there's no motivation. Why would you want to do something that's just simply a responsibility that, that isn't an opportunity? But if you look at it as the opportunity without the responsibility, you might not ever get around to it. The opportunity to, because it does take discipline. Engaging with God's Word is one of those things that we can all do. Uh, we can all do it whether, regardless of whether you're doing it at a level 1 or a level 10. We can all do it. Uh, but if we don't understand that it's a responsibility that takes discipline and takes hard work and consistency, and in, so, in some ways it's, it's like parenting or it's like anything beautiful in life. But in parenting you would say, well, I have the opportunity to raise these children, but I have also the responsibility to raise these children. And there are times when it's going to feel more like an opportunity, and there are times when it's going to feel more like a responsibility. And there are aspects of all of that baked into it. Same is true with Bible engagement. So I want to talk about five ways we do engage with God's Word. And uh, I want to use that illustration. That It's not my illustration, but it's a very popular illustration. And it's the illustration of a hand, a hand grasping God's Word. And so if you think about that uh, and, and the five fingers that you have, you can hold the Bible with, with one finger, uh, but it's, it's very unstable. So you actually, you have the Bible, but it could, any kind of thing could, could knock it out of my hand. Uh, you can hold the Bible with, with two fingers especially if you include the thumb, and, and that'll be important later on, but, uh, but it's still not as good as you could have it. Now, if you take the thumb away, you can hold the Bible with two fingers, but it can really easily be snatched out of your hand. And then every finger you add adds a, a, another level. But then when you put those four fingers right there and you put it right there, th this is a firm grasp on God's Word. And so when we talk about engaging with the Bible, when you put these five things together, you get a good firm grasp on God's Word, and that's always been a helpful illustration to me. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, these, these four, and then we're going to add that fifth one at the end, that fifth one that really clinches it. Uh, so first, we engage with God's Word by hearing the Bible. And, and I want to distinguish hearing the Bible from reading the Bible. There's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, the Bible was written, most of the Bible was written, to be heard. We don't often think of that because we live in an age where we have access to written copies of God's Word. That wasn't true until about 500 years ago. The, the printing press made that true, that common people could have the Bible in their hands. Uh, I have heard that a scroll of one book uh, around the, the first century A.D. would cost about $20,000 in, in modern uh, numbers. And so just people couldn't afford that. I mean, what if you had to buy all 66 books of the Bible in an individual scroll and they cost you 20 grand a piece? You wouldn't have a Bible. So groups would have the Bible. Synagogues might have a copy of the Torah and then you might have a copy of this letter or that letter. But you kind of had to go and search for it or you went to public readings of the Scriptures. So you would go and your church would gather and read, public, uh, read the Scripture publicly. When you read the book of, Le of Revelation uh, and, it, and it talks about the seven angels of the churches, well, those are those seven messengers, most likely a, an appointed reader uh, who, who was literate and who could read and who could read it aloud to the church. And so uh, when, when you read the, the books of Paul, you'll see, uh, read this letter to, to the church at, um, at Colossae and have the letter to the church at Colossae read in your church. And so read, read these aloud. And then, of course, this scripture that we have here, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Paul tells Timothy to devote himself to the public reading of Scripture. Uh, so again, this is where the, the whole church would gather and they would read Scripture. This was a part of the worship of the synagogue. It's still a part of the worship of the synagogue. Some more liturgical churches that you might attend, uh, like a Presbyterian church or a Lutheran church, will have a portion where they're reading a Scripture portion from the week. Well, this is something that's been passed down generation after generation, century after century, uh, where the church might have access to that scripture and the, the actual members did not. And so reading, hearing the Bible read is an important part of an engaging with God's Word. One of the ways we do that is by listening to sermons. 
Bible-based biblical sermons. That's one way we listen to the Word. Uh, and of course, a sermon is a little different from Scripture. But then we have this great thing called audio Bibles. And uh, wow, we can, we can listen to all these people with extremely talented voices. Uh, some of them dramatize the Bible. Some of them read it just with a, with a really great voice. I've recently heard that Robert Smith has at least a New Testament that he reads through. And uh, Robert Smith is a, is a well-known pastor and preacher here uh, in, in our state and preaches all over the, the country as well. But he's really uh, well-known and loved by, by uh, uh, those of us in Alabama. Uh, and he's got a great voice, so I've, I've seen that he has one out there. James Earl Jones has one. If you want Darth Vader to read the Bible to you, then there you go. You can do it. Uh, so there's all kinds of options out there. Uh, but then there's just so there's the audio Bible, and please take advantage of those. But then there's just reading together as a family or reading together as a couple or a group of friends. And when I was um, early in ministry, one of my pastors just said, Hey, come to my office. And I, he buzzed me, and I went over there to his office. And he said, I just wanted you to sit here and we're going to read some scripture together. And he read a chapter and then I read a chapter out loud. And then I passed the Bible back to him and he read a chapter. He passed it back to me and I read a chapter. It was an amazing experience. I, I don't know of a time that I had set aside just to read and hear the scripture being read out loud. And it's a different deal. It's a, t it's a completely different experience than reading it yourself. Uh, is having scripture read to you and listening intently. Probably most of us grew up with parents who read the Bible out loud to us, and that makes an impression on you. So I want to encourage you to, to hear the Bible, work on engaging the Bible, uh, especially with other people, by hearing the Word read out loud. Uh, that's a discipline. So that's one thing. A second thing is engaging God's Word by reading the Bible. So there's hearing and there's reading. Uh, so uh, verse, uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So Paul says a lot in a short amount of space there. He says things were written. And, and that's really the point that I wanted to make with this verse is that God could have chosen any other um, way, any other media type. He has them all at His exposure. And, and He could have chosen any of them to deliver His Word to us but He chose the written Word. Sometimes people will, will ask me uh, from time to time, what do you think about the Passion of the Christ? Or what do you think about the Chosen? Uh, those kind of things. I'm not against any of those things. Uh, I think those are all great. But I do think we've got to center, we've got to understand that when God chose to reveal Himself to mankind, He did not make a movie or a miniseries. And so a movie and a miniseries can help us with Scripture. But we talked about this when we talked about the sufficiency of the Scripture. One of the things we've got to be careful about is saying, man, I really love the chosen because the chosen, uh, you know, it, it brings things alive for me. And that's great in a way that it can bring things alive, but it's got to bring you back to this book because God chose to reveal it in written form. And there's a reason for that. Uh, there's a reason He didn't reveal it in dramatic form that could be uh, recorded and, and passed on to us. So those things are supplements to the Bible. Same is true of visiting the Holy Land. I mean, visiting the Holy Land is amazing. And you stand there and, and you say, wow, this is where this happened and this is where that happened. But those of you who have been to the Holy Land know there is little that is more powerful than being in the spot and reading the Scriptures while you're in that spot. And you go, this really happened. And it ought to drive you back to the Scriptures. Not to say, man, I'm tired of this old written old book. I just want to see all the cool places where things happened. We've got to be very careful about that. And we've got to say, no, this gets us back to, to the Word. Why? Because God chose to reveal Himself through a written Word. Uh, it also tells us that this written Word is given for our instruction and it helps us with endurance and encouragement and hope. Wow, we, we need all of those things. So we want to go to reading the Bible. Uh, I want to encourage you to commit to read the Bible daily. Uh, and I want to tell you, I know a lot of you use audio Bibles, and, and I want you to use audio Bibles. You should. Uh, they are good, but they're not the same as reading a physical Bible. Now, time constraints might not allow you to read a chapter at a time in a physical Bible. But at some point, at least during your week, maybe you're not able to do it every day. Maybe you commute long distances or something like that. Uh, but find some time during the week where you're actually looking at a written uh, copy of God's Word. And, and the research is in. The research has been conducted uh, in many, many uh, cases and instances. E-readers are not the same as holding a physical book. Now, 
If the only thing you read God's Word on is an iPad or an iPhone, then, then good for you. But we all know what happens when we're in God's Word on the iPhone. We're in God's Word right up until somebody texts us. And as much as we can say, well, I'm not going to be distracted. Uh, when that text comes through, you go, well, I'll just look real quickly and see what they need. And then whatever they need takes you on a 20-minute journey and all of a sudden you're doing the Wordle for the day and you go, oh man, I thought I was actually reading the Bible. Uh, so same thing can happen on Sunday morning. You're listening to the sermon and the pastor says, turn to uh, you know, Hebrews chapter 3. And you're in Hebrews chapter 3 and all of a sudden your buddy texts you and you go, oh, I'll just check this out and get right back to it. Well, your concentration's broken and that kind of thing. Uh, nobody can actually get a notification into this. Uh, there's no way for anybody to make my Bible, uh, my physical Bible ding. Uh, another good advantage of it, and this has happened to me on several occasions. I'm sure it's happened to some, uh, some of you as well. When you sit in a public place with a Bible open uh, and get a Bible that looks like a Bible, you know, and again, there's nothing wrong with hardback Bibles. I mean, my goodness, we're, when this was first written, it was a scroll. If you can get a scroll, that'll really draw some attention. Uh, but, you know, there's all kind of Bibles, but get a Bible that looks like a Bible and you got your Bible open and man, you might as well be a unicorn, right? People are really curious about who is this person sitting in a public place with a Bible open? And I've had it happen on many occasions. I couldn't help but notice, are, are you reading the Bible? Yeah, I'm, I'm reading the Bible. You know what? I, I have a question about the Bible. Or are you a pastor? Can you pray for my mom or something like that? Uh, we, we go out to a local restaurant uh, and we go almost every week as a ministerial staff. And so we haven't done it as much as we should. But uh, from time to time, we'll ask the waitress or the waiter, hey, we're going to pray for our meals or anything we can pray for you about. And one of the coolest things that has happened on multiple occasions is on days when we may not ask that. We may not ask that question. We, it just happened just two weeks ago. Um, the waitress stopped by and said, hey, y'all are the praying people, right? Hey, would you pray for this? I really need somebody to pray for me today. Well, the same thing will happen if you got your Bible open. Hey, you're that Bible person. I've seen you in here with your Bible open. I, I have a question about the Bible. So get that physical copy. It'll help you. And then set aside times. Uh, do your daily Bible reading. Do your one chapter a day. It doesn't take very long. Uh, but then also set aside some time where you say, I'm just going to take my Bible. I'm going to open it. And me and God are going to have a two-way conversation. I'm going to pray a little bit, read a little bit, pray a little bit, read a little bit. You'll be amazed at what God will speak to you and the way God's, God will speak to you in that way. Uh, look at the prayers of Paul. And if you'll notice when Paul prays, uh, I, I want to give you, a, I want to give you a, a, an assignment, okay? A, um, a, a sort of a challenge here. Uh, look at Paul's prayers and find the end of them. Here's what you're going to find. You can't find the end of them. Sometimes it's hard to find the start of them. Paul will be talking about theology, talking about a pastoral issue or something, and he'll just burst into a prayer in the middle of it. And he'll go from talking to the Ephesians to talking to God. And then before you know it, he's right back to talking to the Ephesians. It's like his prayer and his pastoring don't have a, a division line. He just gets into prayer, and then when he's finished with the prayer, he rolls right back in, and you think, well, where did the prayer end and the pastoral advice begin? And I've actually uh, had the privilege of, of being around a pastor who was like that. And he was my pastor, Larry. He was his uncle. He's passed away now, but he pastored in Mississippi. And uh, his name was Bendon, and man, Uncle Bendon. We, we, uh, we uh, didn't get to spend as much time with him as we would like. But when you were around him, you knew you had been around somebody who walked with God. And uh, he was a powerful man, powerful pastor. And you would literally you'd be driving down the road, and, and he would be talking to you about something. And all of a sudden, he's talking, and it doesn't make any sense what he's saying. And you realize, oh, he's praying. And then in the middle of his prayer, he would just say, so uh, did y'all want to get the seafood for lunch? Or where did you want to do barbecue for lunch? And like, well, hold are you asking me or God? Oh, what's going on here, you know? But he just, he just, when he needed to talk to God, it was God might as well have been sitting in the passenger seat and he and God are having a conversation and then he's going to bring us into the conversation. And so I want to encourage you to do that with the Bible. Open the Bible, you're reading the Bible out loud and then just pray a little bit, read a little more, pray a little bit and try to set aside a time. You know, on our men's retreat, uh, we send the men out with a stopwatch and we say for, for 59 minutes, uh, for an hour, go and pray. For our staff, we've done the same thing for our staff. Gather together, we want you to open your Bible and spend an hour reading God's Word and praying. And at first you're going to say, I just can't do that. I don't have that much to pray about. 
But if you'll get in God's Word, you'll find out. You actually have more uh, to talk about than, than you realize. Uh, so we engage God's Word by reading the Bible. We engage God's Word by studying the Bible. Uh, I thought our Awana verse would be the best of many verses we could use to talk about studying Scripture. Uh, but uh, given that our Awana kids are, are uh, using this verse right now, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. If we're going to rightly handle the word of truth, we're going to have to put the work in uh, to understand how to handle the word of truth. And so uh, there are, um, there's the need to study the Bible. And, uh, and you can study theology. Theology, systematic theology, is a way to study the Bible. So you might not necessarily be studying the Bible directly, but I want to encourage you, don't get too far removed from the text. Uh, a good devotional book is great. It can help your prayer life. It can help your time with the Lord. But beware of how much a devotional book might move you away from the actual words of the Bible. I'm always looking for resources, books, study tools that are going to push me back to the words of the Bible, not take me away from the words of the Bible. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And you might be doing some devotional reading over here or some theological reading over here that's separate from your Bible study. But when it comes to studying the Bible, stay as close to the actual Bible as you can. Read books that talk about the Bible, read books that talk about the background of the Bible, read books that talk about the theology of the Bible, read books that every you know, few paragraphs have Bible verses uh, that are helping you understand God's Word when you're studying the Bible. I put three resources there that uh, can help you study the Bible. Um, there are two of them that are excellent and there is one that's readily available to you. And so um, uh, I do uh, have a few copies of, of How to Love the Bible. And I, I wrote that book, uh, How to Love the Bible, because I saw a lack of resources out there for someone to know what to do when they sit down and open their Bible. Uh, so it's written to say you, you have your Bible open now what? What do you do? What do you actually do first and second and third and fourth? Uh, those other um, resources out there are fantastic. Uh, I always said if I had found Grasping God's Word, I would never have written How to Love the Bible. I would have written some other book because Grasping God's Word is that good. Living by the Book uh, is a book I had heard about for many years. Uh, when I read it, I went, wow, this is very similar to my book. So um, uh, but just better written by, by a better author. So those are all uh, great resources that will help you know how to study the Bible. Um, fourth, we engage God's Word by memorizing the Bible. Uh, so Psalm 119, uh, 11, I have stored your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Uh, many of us know it as I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Uh, either way you memorize it is okay. Uh, by the way, you can memorize in the King James, you can memorize in the NIV, you can memorize in the ESV, you can memorize in the Latin, you can memorize in the Hebrew, you can memorize in the Septuagint. Just memorize, you know, memorize Scripture. Uh, I would ask you, I would encourage you to be consistent in the version that you memorize because if not, you're going to drive yourself crazy. Pick a version that's a good solid version and invest time in memorizing in that. Uh, but you want to memorize the Bible. Uh, you ought to memorize verses if you can then you ought to try to memorize chapters or sections of chapters, uh, and then you ought to try memorizing books. And I know uh, everybody says, oh, I can't do that. I, I want you to know, with a handful of exceptions, nobody says, well, let me tell you one thing I'm good at, memorizing. I'm really good at memorizing. There are only a handful of people out there who are good at memorizing. None of us are good at memorizing. It's, it's like saying, uh, I'm no good at running a 5K although I've never actually trained to run a 5K. Well, you can get good at running a 5K. Uh, you, can, you might not have the same time that somebody else would have, but it's not about that. It's about putting in the work, doing the work, and, and doing your best at, at, your, at your personal best. It's like saying, oh, I'll tell you one thing, I'm no good at bench press. Well, how many times have you ever done it? I tried it that one time, and uh, four, the, somebody put 450 pounds on the rack, and I couldn't even budget. Uh, well, of course you're no good at bench pressing. You've never done it before, and you try to do what very few people on the earth can do. You know, start out with the bar, and I bet you can bench press the bar, and then work up from there. And, and you know, your muscles are going to be a little sore, and it's going to be hard the first time you do it. But you'll build your muscles up. The same is true with memorization. Um, I've never actually worked with anybody who said, you know what, by the way, I'm really good at memorizing. I did work with one man one time who I believe had a photographic memory, but he didn't tell me that. I just found that out as we went. He had his, there's no such thing as actual photographic memory from what I understand. He had as close to one as I've ever seen. 
he could just read something and then recite it right back to you. Uh, and he could recite long chunks of things and he could recite difficult things. Um, but he didn't tell me that. He didn't think he was good at memory either. You're probably better at memorizing than, uh, than you think you are. But I've, I've never worked with anybody who said, you know what, I've got a really good memory. I've also never worked with anybody who couldn't memorize one chapter in a week. Now, I want you to think about what I just said. I've never worked with anybody who said they had a good memory. I've also never worked with anybody who could not memorize one chapter in a week if they put the time in. So, what does that mean? That means that, that there are probably some people out there who are really good at memory, but that's not most of us. And there are probably some people out there who no matter how much time they put in, they could not memorize an average size chapter of the Scriptures in a week. But that's very few people. So, and by the way, you don't have to memorize a chapter. How about a verse? Now, some people would say, well, I just, I just don't have time. On the back of your notes, I did something today. I, I found the number of chapters and verses in, uh, in every book of the Bible. So if you look at the top, you see Matthew. Matthew has 28 chapters and 1,071 verses, and then it averages 38 verses per chapter. So over to the right, I, I put, if you memorize one verse per week or two verses per week or three verses per week or one chapter per week, how long would it take you to memorize the entire book? Uh, those green cells, and then um, the, uh, the second section is, is the same information. It's just how many months would it take you to memorize it. So this is how many weeks, and uh, this is how many months. So if you're looking over here uh, and it says, it says 1.01, that means it will take you just over a week to memorize that, that particular book. Uh, if you see, uh, like in the case with Matthew, 20.6, um, then, then it would actually take you uh, 20 years if you memorize one verse a week, 10 years if you memorize two verses, so on and so forth. Uh, if you memorize one chapter a week, it'll take you half a year to memorize the entire book of Matthew. Now, uh, these are all just numbers to kind of give you an idea. The ones that are highlighted green um, would take you one year or less. So if you only memorize, oh, just think about this, one verse per week, then there are one, two, three, four, five, six, New Testament verses that if you only memorized one verse per week, you would actually memorize the entire book in a year or less. That's pretty shocking to me. Now, the yellow means one month or less. So if you're memorizing one chapter per week, then there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are ten books that you could memorize the entire book in one month or less. Now, keep, that, keep in mind that I just said I've never worked with anybody uh, who couldn't actually memorize one chapter a week. So you put all that together, and, and it does take a, uh, some time. It takes uh, so, some significant time. My experience is that it takes 30 to 40 minutes per day, five days a week, to memorize a chapter. Um, so, so what I did is I rounded that up to an hour. And I said, what if it takes you an hour, one hour a day, five days a week, to memorize a chapter? Uh, that was my baseline that I used. Then I went online and I found the most recent research. And I want you to know this is not self-reporting. These are these apps. They actually, when you log on to Netflix, they know how long you've been on Netflix. You don't know how long you've been on Netflix, but Netflix knows how long you've been on Netflix. And so they know their users. This is the average number for all users in the United States uh, who have a Netflix account. They spend an average of 3.2 hours a day on Netflix. Uh, the average social media user, and for some people it's more Twitter and less Facebook or more X and less Facebook. For some people it is, uh, it is more YouTube and less of this or that. But the total average for all of those per person is two hours a day. Mobile gaming. The average American spends 4.2 hours a day mobile gaming. Now, that's some people who are spending about 24 hours a day mobile gaming and some people who are spending zero hours a day mobile gaming. But this includes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sound so out of touch right now, Bubble Pop or whatever that's called and it includes the Candyland game. So whatever, you, you know, if you're playing a little game on your phone, it includes all of that and it also includes, you know, uh, Call of Duty or whatever that is. Uh, so mobile gaming. I actually don't think it includes Call of Duty. But total, 9.4 hours. Now if you look at the, the notes down there, those are some overlapping times. 
because some people are on Facebook while they're playing Bubble Pop and so on and so forth. So there's an overlap uh, there uh, of 9.4 hours. But that's 9.4 hours total invested in, in those areas, Netflix, social media, and mobile gaming. That is the average U.S. citizen. Now, two things I'll say about this. You're going to look at that and go, well, I don't spend that much time on that, and maybe you don't. Uh, but I also will tell you this. We do not know how much time we spend on those apps. Those apps know how much time we spend on them. We don't know. We always underestimate how much time we're on them. They are time killers, and they're designed to be time killers. Now, the chart to the right says, if it took you one hour, five days a week to memorize a chapter, how long would it take you to memorize the entire New Testament if you devoted that time, first, if you devoted all of that time, and then three quarters of that time, and then half of that time, and then 25% of that time? So if all you did, if all the average American did was cut out Netflix, it would take them one and a half years to memorize the entire New Testament. If, they, if the average American cut out all social media and used that to memorize the New Testament, it would take them six months to memorize the entire New Testament. Now, I'm not saying they could actually do that. At some point, your brain would be overloaded. This is just for illustrative purposes. But your brain would be overloaded. You'd say, I can't memorize anything else. And, and that's true. It's just to, to help us see, my, we are spending a lot of time on things that won't really matter. And the Lord does not want us to cut out all things we enjoy. God did not design the world to cut out everything we enjoy. He actually designed the world for us to enjoy all the things He's created. And some of those are the creative minds that come up with certain TV shows and, uh, and, and even certain mobile gaming and all those kinds of things. Um, but especially when it comes to social media, mobile gaming, it's like salt, a dash. You ever go to a restaurant and somebody takes that salt before they ever taste the food? And I mean, they are just showering that. And you think that is, that is more salt than any human needs to consume in one week. You know, and you go, did you even taste it? Uh, you know, salt is best when it's, oh, you know, I'll just put a little dash on there. Uh, but this, you know, you end up on blood pressure medicine and with stents and all those kinds of things. Uh, the same is true of social media. But sometimes it's hard to just do that little dash. Uh, and so we've got to really make a lot of decisions. And one of those decisions is that we've got to stop saying we can't memorize things. The truth is we're not willing to put into work to memorize things. That's the bottom line. And, and that, that means that we've got to make some lifestyle changes. And, um, and if, we, I mean, if we never again watch a Netflix series, then we would miss out on something in life, I guess. But what if we replace that with memorizing a book of the Bible? What, what would your life be like if you didn't watch a, a single TV series this, this week, uh, this year, I mean, in 2024? You just never got around to watching any kind of stream on-demand thing, but you memorized the book of Ephesians. How would your life be different? Your life would be drastically different. You'd be closer to the Lord. You'd have more joy. You can't help but be overjoyed when you read Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2. You can't help but be overjoyed. You'd be a better husband. You'd be a better wife. You'd be a better friend uh, because of everything in Ephesians 1. And you'd, uh, in Ephesians, you'd start to see things that you never even knew were there. You, you would have as much knowledge of Ephesians as, as uh, somebody who's writing a commentary on Ephesians. And it's all right there for you to, to grab. Uh, but you've just got to make some difficult decisions. And then, finally, we engage God's Word by applying the Bible. Uh, this is the thumb. Uh, James says it. Two ways. I, I put the positive way, um, as positive as James gets on this subject. Uh, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So he says you need to do the word, not just hear it. Okay, that makes sense. He gives the illustration of you know looking in the mirror and walking away and forgetting what you look like. Um, we would never do that. We hear the word. We got to apply the word. But then he gives it in in a, a little harsher way in chapter four, verse seventeen. James keeps coming back to the same themes in his book. Whoever knows the right thing to do it and fails to do it. For him, it is sin. I've spent time in the Word. I have learned something that God wants me to do. I will now close it and not apply it. Well, I just became a more educated sinner. I just became better at sinning. 
because now I know, I know more things to do and I'm still not doing any of them, so now I'm a better sinner. So that's why number five is the thumb. It is the one that really, I mean, if you read it and you memorize it and you hear it and you study it and you don't apply it, you might as well be holding it in your hand like this and it's gonna be snatched right out of your hand. You might as well not even have it. But if you only hear it and you apply it, you're actually better off than if you read it and hear it. If you only hear it and memorize it, I mean, if you only memorize it and apply it, then you're still better off than if you only do two of these. This is the one. This is the one that the Pharisees missed. Hey, they memorized it. They studied it. They read it. It was their entire life. They did not apply it. So this is the one. We've got to apply it. Lord, you show me in your word. What do you want me to do about this? You know, we have more access to scripture than anybody in history has ever had. And I've heard stories of Christians in uh, places like China who have one section and they... they not to desecrate the Bible, but to share the Bible. They tear it out by the binding and they keep the binding together and they'll share that book and that book will make its way around to house churches. And, that's all the, and that may be all the pastor ever sees is that book. And he'll have that book for a while and then he'll swap it with somebody else. And when you think about that and, and what we have, man, they're, but they, yet they apply. You know, they see it and they understand and they know and they're sharing the gospel. So we've got to apply it. So we hear it, we read it, we study it, we memorize it, and then most importantly, we apply it. Sometimes God has not revealed more to us because we have not been obedient to what He's already revealed to us.